That was the song Never Kill an Ape. It appears on the album Lust for Rust by the Surf Zombies. You can find out more about them over at their website, thesurfzombies.bandcamp.com, or you can find them on Facebook, or you can go over to our website at monsterkidradio.net and follow the link in the show notes. You're going to find that link in the show notes along with everything else that we're talking about here on this episode of Monster Kid Radio. This is episode number 71. I'm your host, Derek M. Cook. I want to welcome you to the show. I want to say thanks to the Surf Zombies for opening us up with that song. You guys and gals are going to get to hear that in its entirety at the end of this episode. I think the title of the song is appropriate because we are continuing the King Kong love here on the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. Now, last week we had Frank Dietz on the show to talk about the upcoming documentary, Long Live the King, the legacy of Kong. If you haven't listened to those episodes, well, I'll tell you briefly about that at the end of this episode, after I've had a chance to talk with Stephen D. Sullivan about the movie, The Son of Kong. That's right, King Kong had a sequel, and I think sometimes people kind of forget that. They go from King Kong to Mighty Joe Young. Well, nine months after King Kong was released, The Son of Kong came about. You know, this is an underrated gem. This is something that Steve and I both really enjoyed for a number of different reasons. And you're going to hear about those reasons in part one of our discussion with Stephen D. Sullivan about the Son of Kong. We're going to talk about the sequel, the characters, what happens after King Kong, which you don't normally see happen at the end of most monster movies, or at least following up most monster movies, the roles that some of these characters play. There's some interesting gender things going on, even some racial things going on that we're going to touch on briefly as we talk about the son of Kong. So that's the bulk of this episode. Now, Stephen E. Sullivan is a regular guest here on Monster Kid Radio, and right now he is in the throes of Tournament of Death 3. This is his A Chapter a Day live novel. Every Olympics, he does one of these. Every night of the Olympics, he sits down, he watches the Olympics, and he writes a chapter of this fantasy monster novel. Tournament of Death 3, to find out more about that, go to his website, stephendsullivan.com, or again, go to monsterkidradio.net, and follow the link in the show notes to Tournament of Death 3 on Kickstarter. Here's how it works. You kick into the Kickstarter, you start getting chapters, and you start getting the book as he writes it. You get access to the chapters as they go out. I'm excited for Steve to be doing that this year, and I'm excited for you guys and gals to get involved with that Kickstarter campaign. So again, monsterkidradio.net, you'll find the links to everything that we talk about here on the show. Also on our website, you're going to find links to our Facebook page and our Facebook group, and you're going to find our contact information. Our email address is monsterkidradio at gmail.com, and our phone number is 503-4795-MKR. That's 503-479-5657. You can call and leave a voicemail of up to three minutes in length at that voicemail line, and I can address it here on the show. There's also links to our YouTube page, our Live 365 channel, our Flickr album, basically anything that you need to know about Monster Kid Radio. Between episodes, you're going to find it on our website or our Facebook page. I'm excited to get to part one of the Monster Kid Radio discussion about The Son of Kong with Stephen D. Sullivan. I think we're going to get to that right after this. The question is, where did the horror hosts go when they have no other place to go? And the answer is, the horror host graveyard. <laughs> Make sure you swing by the horror host graveyard and dig up the fetid, rotting remains of horror hosts from the past, present, and future. Man, you can go there and find information about all the great horror hosts, old and new. It's like the manifold of monster mayhem. Horror hosts from the past. You can find out about Zachary, Vampira, Gulardi. All kinds of great stuff. You've got people's music, you got movie clips, you got horror hosting clips. And you can find out about current horror hosts like Penny Dreadful, that's me, the Bone Jangler, Dr. Gang Green, and uh, Professor Anton Griffin, Carlos Borloff. They're all there waiting for you in the graveyard. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Oh, we know how to party there. Oh, I'm telling you, rock and roll, go blue, green, purple. I mean, and, oh, we get it on. What you should do is go to horror host graveyard. Graveyard.com. I like to visit the horrorhostgraveyard.com. Horrorhostgraveyard.com. Well, we're going to go back to Skull Island and we're going to go with an old friend, Stephen D. Sullivan, writer, author, game designer, and fellow monster kid. Welcome to the show. Hey, great to be back. 
You've got an online project I wanted to mention real quick. I've mentioned it on the show before, Daikaiju Attack. Yeah, and that's that's going to be going on for a while. I don't have a specific – I have an end to the story, but I don't have a specific length that it's going to be to reach that end. And Daikaiju Attack is, as far as I know, the first serialized giant monster story, and it's free online on daikaijuattack.com or sdsullivan.com or stephendsullivan.com. There's a lot of ways you can get to it. And we've got a Facebook page where we talk about that and about giant monsters in general, which is a great love of mine. So. Oh, yeah. We all love giant monsters. So, you know, you wanted to do Son of Kong, another giant monster. Not quite Daikaiju. Well, I don't know. Would you consider the King Kong movies Daikaiju-ish? I, they're definitely giant monsters. Sure. But I, I think at some point you have to mostly use kaiju for Japanese rubber suit monsters. You know, I think once the point they get to CGI, I'm not entirely sure that they're kaiju at that point. Pacific Rim, notwithstanding, but that's clearly kind of in the same tradition. So the line is blurry there. I do know people that will say that Kong and Son of Kong and just about any other, you know, giant monster is a kaiju. Strictly speaking, I'm not an expert in Japanese. I don't speak the language. I know a few words, and I wrote an award-winning uh, fantasy series uh, based in Japanese culture, the Legend of the Five Rings series. But I don't know the language. But I believe that technically, kaiju simply means strange creature or strange beast. Mm-hmm. And dai kaiju, dai is great or big, so dai kaiju means giant great beast. So Technically, King Kong would be a daikaiju, even though he's not a rubber suit monster, except in the version with Jessica Lange. <laughs> well, you did have you know King Kong escapes, and there is that you know the the Godzilla versus King Kong. So maybe I don't know. And then you got yeah, Gorgo hanging even, out over there. So who knows? Easier. Yeah, it's it's kind of a mess. But so that Kong is definitely a kaiju. But is that Kong the same King Kong that we're? I don't know, man. It's it's a mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in some sense, it doesn't matter to me in exactly. terms of the the Facebook uh, group. You know, people are not. I'm not going to throw people out for talking about King Kong. In fact, I hope people come to the group and talk about King Kong and them and the Deadly Mantis and all sorts of other oh, yeah. giant monsters, whether they be CGI or rubber suit or stop motion animation. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's a thriving Facebook group, so links to all of this will be in the show notes over at uh, monsterkidradio.net. Yep. And so, the story's a classic. It's set in 1966 in Japan, so it's a classic giant monster movie done as a pro story in serialized fashion every week. Every, every weekend, you get a new one. I'm trying to hit every Friday, but I hope people will cut me a little slack if I slip to Saturday or Sunday, but definitely well, every weekend. Well, it's a free story. What are they going to do? Want their right, money back? Exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, but you guys should go check that out. Everybody should be reading along and, and, and find out what's happening next in that story. I'm fascinated by the idea of it being kind of retro and that it's told in that time period, which is where the rubber suited monsters really kind of thrived. I, I love that idea and I love the approach. Thanks. Definitely check that out. Seems and like a good idea yeah. at the time. We'll see if you know if uh, suddenly Hollywood options it, it'll be a great idea. <laughs> oh sure, sure. <laughs> Until sure. then, it'll be the the lonely genius idea. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you planning on putting this out as a print edition down the line when it's all done, or? Yeah, I think I probably will. I think I'll probably collect it into both print edition and an ebook edition as well. Okay. And uh, believe it or not, because I never do anything small, I actually have ideas for i think at least four more stories set in the same universe with some of the same characters after that if people love it i'll keep doing it as long as people love it so right on well here's a clunky segue speaking of stories set in the same universe son of kong takes place in the same universe as king (laughs) kong (laughs) it does yeah it's it's a direct sequel it is a direct sequel and, and the story takes place just a month after the end of the original King Kong. It was released about nine months after the first film. Right, yeah. They and actually they, they released it as quickly yeah. as possible. Which after. blows my mind. Right. Well, the original King Kong took three years to make. The special effects took 55 weeks, I think, if I'm remembering the notes that I, I read earlier. And then this one was done start to finish in nine months. Holy cow. Years. 
So, yeah. which might explain why the two aren't kind of equal uh, in terms <laughs> of, well, anything except maybe music. Right. Well, they use yeah. The music's great. They were able to save some money, I suppose, because mo- some of the models were already built. Some of the sets were still standing. Mm-hmm. You know, so you don't have to worry about that part of the production design schedule, I guess. But it really dove right in, and, and in some spots it does show, unfortunately. Well, it does, but it's. I don't think this. Um, one of the reasons we're talking about this today is I don't think this film maybe gets as much love as it deserves. Yeah, it is not King Kong. It's no. not close to King Kong as Robert Armstrong, as Carl Denham says during the movie to the son of Kong, he says you're not a patch on your old man you know, that's kind of the writer and the the character speaking both to the Mm -hmm. character and the audience but at the same time it's still a wonderful family fantasy picture it has some cool monsters in it and some cool Mm -hmm. sights, and the the story though, I, I read somewhere that that people thought the story was really shoddy. I, I got to say, I, I kind of don't agree. I think it's a, it's a pretty good story. It's, it's written by the, uh, the same woman that wrote the original King Kong, the final, the final drafts of King Kong, it's Ruth Rose. Mm-hmm. And it has most of the same people in it. Yeah, I mean, you got Carl Denham. I mean, and I wish that film franchise did what this movie did. You get to the end of a horror movie or a monster movie, and these characters have survived this traumatic experience, and credits move on. And sometimes I'm thinking to myself, well, what happens next? How do these people survive? I don't want to write that police report, but I want to know what happens next. You know, how do they get away with moving on with all this horrible thing has happened? And Son of Kong shows us. Carl Denham's in hiding. He's getting sued for destroying the city. <laughs> that I is love one that. Of the, that is one of the reasons I really love this movie. Because at the end of all the other movies, like, all your friends are dead and the city's destroyed. And, oh, well, tomorrow's another day, as Scarlett O'Hara would say. <laughs> right. But this one, it's almost like what would really have happened if King Kong had come to New York with these adventurers. Because... Uh, you know, I know you don't like to do long recaps, but just to let people that maybe haven't seen the film yet know, sure. it starts 30 days after King Kong has caused all this havoc in New York. Carl Denham is being sued by everyone. He is hiding out from process servers. People want him. They want him for obviously the big things, but there's one guy that's uh-huh, a process uh-huh, server that's things. like King Kong caved in the front of his building oh and he twisted his ankle and he's suing for mental distress so there's these frivolous lawsuits along with the stuff mm-hmm. that you know really happened so they're coming after denim and denim and Engelhorn, the captain from the ship they get together and they decide they're gonna flee the country before they can be caught they end up in the far east meeting up with the captain of the ship that originally found the native from Kong Island that gave them the map that led them to Kong Island. That leads them back to Kong Island to search for treasure. And then they meet the son of Kong and the, the rest of the last 30 minutes of the moves right. uh, on Kong on Skull Island. So <laughs> the fact that I love the beginning of this, I love oh, the yeah. fact that he's hiding out in this house. He's hiding out in his apartment. He's got a, a landlady who's named Mrs. Hudson. I think, who is like this, maybe it's the same land, landlady that Sherlock Holmes had or tip of the hat to her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and she's trying to protect him, but she's the only person on his side. Everyone else we meet is trying to find him so they can drag him into court, including like this one funny guy who's managed to catch him, I don't know, it was like a dozen times or something, and end up actually helping him escape from the house. But the fact that in this world, the actions of Kong had real consequences that had real effects on this character. Mm-hmm. I love that. I think that's the coolest thing ever. It's great. And I like that you mentioned the, the little funny guy that's the process server that keeps catching him because he's putting on makeup or wearing costumes or whatever. I love the interaction there because there's no real malice. It's not like, oh, I'm going to get you, Denim. It's like, hey, got you again, and thanks for keeping me employed because there's more coming. You know? Right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> right. you know, and he's the one that tips off Denim that this process serving, you know, this is fine and all, but you're about to get indicted. Right. So, um, right. And he also helps him escape up. Yeah. from the rooming house when all the other process guys are out front trying to find Denim so that they can subpoena him. 
And he, this one guy that has managed to catch him says, well, you know, I caught you. I don't need to let the other guys catch you. So he helps sneak him out. After they've snuck Denim out, there's like a congregation out in front of the house of the other process servers. And yeah. they're all in disguise. And yep. one of them is disguised as a blind man selling pencils and stuff. Yep. <laughs> and they're all like, well, how are we going to get in? And I just that kind of doggedness. And at the same time, it's serious, but it's lighthearted in the sense that, as you said, it's like people aren't going, oh, I'm going to get them. They're going through basically the U.S. legal system as it existed back then and, and in some cases still does. But there wasn't all this kind of crazy melodrama. And I can't say that skipping out on all this stuff, which Denim does, <laughs> is... True, true. That's not the most heroic thing to do. But on the other hand, by the end of the movie, it all comes back around. In some sense, he's not fleeing justice because he wants to flee justice. He's fleeing justice because he feels like he's he doesn't have any other choice that it's not that he doesn't want to pay restitution to everyone it's that he can't and if he's locked up he knows that he won't be able to ever i really liked that this movie seemed to humanize denim more than in the first film i think he's great in the first film but there is that kind of we got to make the picture we got to make the picture kind of drive that was almost parodied in the peter jackson remake right but in this film He's just a guy who made some horrible decisions in the movie. He even kind of owns up to that. Like, I guess I kind of feel bad for what I put that son of Kong's old man through, you know? I, right, yeah, exactly. I, I feel bad about it, you know? And it, it really humanizes the guy while giving him some, I don't know, some lighthearted kind of moments with the process server and such. And I, I really liked his performance in this almost as much. Oh, okay, you know, I'm going to say it as much as I did like his performance, uh, Robert Armstrong's performance in King Kong. None of the remakes of any of the Kong movies have ever captured the character of Carl Denham, which is one of the things that drives both the original Kong and this movie forward. He's a showman, and he's ruthless in a sense. He's not crazy, and he's not without compassion. He's just very driven. Right. And while I kind of enjoy Peter Jackson's film in many, many ways, I don't think Jack Black is a patch. On Robert Armstrong. Oh, no. Carl Not a patch on him. And the funny thing was, while I was you know, doing research to talk about this today and reading Harryhausen's book on it, Harryhausen doesn't think much of Son of Kong, and Willis O'Brien didn't think much of Son of Kong. It's like no one thinks much of Son of Kong, except apparently Robert Armstrong, who actually preferred it. Right, exactly. <laughs> to the original Kong. And that's because he has a character arc going. It's great. He's got a character arc going. He gets a little bit of romance in there. I mean, he's on a character's journey here. He's doing what the other characters around him did in King Kong in Son of Kong. Right. And he's and so darn charismatic, so you can't help vote, you know, root for him the whole time. It's great. Right. Exactly. You know, I mean, usually I don't have a lot of respect for people fleeing the law. But with Carl Denham, <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> it's Carl Denham. You know, I mean, he didn't mean to cause all of that chaos, you right. know, when, when he found Kong and managed to knock Kong out, he says, we're millionaires, boys, share it with all of you. It's like, he was so swept up in the kind of showman thing that he didn't maybe think he thought he could control it and he couldn't control it. And Kong gets loose and destroys a whole bunch of Manhattan and people die and stuff. But that wasn't his intention at all. He was just looking to put on a really great show and to get rich not only for himself, but he wanted to share that with everyone that was with him. Yeah. And you can see that in the original film, the way he treats everybody there. And you, you see it again at the end of, at the end of Son of Kong, which, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know how spoilery we're going to get. But when things turn good for Denim, Denim doesn't just want it for himself. He wants it for everybody. And I think that's a really admirable character trait that kind of elevates him above a simple snake oil salesman or a huckster he's not looking to rip people off he's looking to entertain people and he's looking for everybody to get rich along with him and i did appreciate that and you know maybe we shouldn't give away the final few moments of the movie because unlike most of the movies we cover here on monster kid radio this is one that i don't feel like everybody has seen right so there are some things that happen toward the end that are kind of gut-wrenching there's a nice twist there and that carries through the 
I'm not keeping it for myself. I'm going to share it with everybody. That through line plays all the way to the very end of the film, and it's nice. Right. And it's there are some things happening too regarding gender roles at the end of the movie that are really interesting as well. But again, I can't talk about it without spoiling it. It's just a touch, but I really liked it, and it made me think this movie needs a more respect. Well, exactly. You know, I mean, we haven't mentioned her by name, but Helen Mack, who is the woman in this film, her character's name is Hilda, but we never actually hear that. We see it in the credits. Yeah, I was about but, to say, we never. they never mention her by name either. So <laughs> That's right. Well, it's because Armstrong doesn't meet – he meets her as part of – she and her father are running this act in, in the Far East where they have dancing monkeys and – that kind of stuff, and they do little musical numbers. They're a very shabby little kind of circus. Oh, boy. The monkey scene was – that was pretty rough. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agreed with the skipper there. You know, I, just, I just want to get a drink and some food, and that's it. I would have skipped that show. What is, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a ratty little circus, but one of the wonderful things about Denim is that he sees there's this crazy little show in town that they've just happened to stop in because they're working their way across the Far East – taking cargo from one place to another place. So they're out looking for cargo, sees the show, says, it's a show, Skipper. We need to go see the show. And then he enjoys it. He's like he's like a monster kid enjoying an Ed Wood movie or something like that. Exactly. He's one of us. <laughs> Exactly. So he, there's these, you know, these monkeys that are doing uh, kind of uh, playing instruments and dancing around and stuff. And then uh, Helen Mack comes out and she plays. Uh, it sounds like a guitar, looks like a, a really big ukulele or something, and sings a little song. And she's okay in kind of a Betty Boop way, but she's kind of charming. And he's like, she's got something. And you're like, oh, you know what? It's a pretty crappy production, but come, he is not crazy. He's right. There's something about that. And so he kind of encourages that, even yeah. though he's down on his luck. He's still trying to encourage other people and pick them up and, and share the wealth, as it were, yeah. to bring them into being part of the world of show business, part of a, a wider world. He's a generous guy. Yeah. It's sh the showmanship in him. I mean, the show business in his blood that you know, allows him to, to kind of find that and then kind of motivates him and, and, and put put her up. And it's just, it's wonderful. Their interactions are great. The actress's name, did we say it already? Helen Mack? Yeah, I'm, I'm in it a couple of times. Okay. She's, she didn't do a lot of other stuff that kind of stood out in my mind, except for she. She was in the uh, Marion C. Cooper. She, she was not she. She was the girlfriend of Leo. Who would I think was Leo in the in the Ursula Andress version too? Who yeah. is the ancient love Callicrates of she, but she's the role for the affection right. in the black and white film. And um, what else was she in? If you've seen His Girl Friday, which if you haven't seen His Girl Friday, you should. It's a wonderful Cary Grant movie with uh, about reporters and she is the persecuted girlfriend of the convicted killer in his girl friday he's not really his girlfriend she was just a girl that showed him some sympathy when he was on the lamb and now the reporters are treating her like he's anyway she's in that too and she's wonderful in, in both those roles now she's new to the, the the kong story at this point but there are a couple other characters that you know are returning i mean we got denim and we got charlie the cook Charlie the Cook, which, again... Of all the people <laughs> to, to pull back in, but, you know, but Victor Wong played him. Right, and not the Victor Wong that was in um, Big Trouble in Little China. No, I saw the name, and I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, not even related to him, but the same name, that happens in the movies sometimes. The funny thing is that, yeah, he's the cook, which is kind of a stereotype role. But he's also a valuable member of the crew. He's someone that Denim likes and trusts. He's the guy that comes when Denim is hiding out in New York. He's the guy that comes to Denim and says, Captain Englehorn, who is also a returning character, Frank Riker, I think, right. says, come see us on the boat. The captain has some kind of a new plan. So Charlie is kind of like, you know, I don't want to go Kirk, Spock, McCoy here, but there's the trio of them, the captain, the cook, and Denim are kind of the nucleus of the people on that ship. I wouldn't say it was kind of really daring for 1933, but in another way, Charlie doesn't spend all his time kind of running around acting crazy and bug-eyed. 
he actually contributes, you know, when they're eventually they have to leave. I don't know how much plot detail we want to give away, but they're, they're forced off of the ship. And thanks to Charlie, they have survival equipment right. when they're forced off of the ship. Denim treats everybody equally. If you're a square guy, Denim will treat you fair and square as an equal, and he'll shoot straight with you. And so that I like the fact that that character is there, even though there is kind of stereotypical o- overtones. At least it's an actual Asian actor. That's true. I was going to say there are some things, like during the little monkey show, he seems more excited than anybody else. He's got that kind of goofy kind of, oh, you know, kind of look to him. But he's right. not... I actually like that, though. It's yeah? because the reason I like Charlie... We should point out that they're in – it's not Macau, but it's somewhere in the far in the far east in this little show. And the audience is filled with people that are native to the area, and none of them are applauding at all. But Charlie is actually applauding, and part of me thinks that's because he also has kind of a generous spirit to him. I don't think he thinks it's a great show, but I think he's willing to applaud because he and Denim are the only people that are applauding. And kind of giving credit to the fact that the people are putting on this show, maybe they they can't they don't have the resources to do anything better. Like for me anyway, I think Charlie appreciates the show for the effort that they're putting into it. Huh, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. I was kind of looking at it as a you know kind of like a childlike wonder kind of thing going on, but uh, no, I can see that. that you know, too. very a very generous kind of supportive. You know, he's a supporting character. He supports Denim and Company. You know, so I could see that. That's a Either and way, they reward, and they reward him in the end. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's in on the he's in on everything. Right, the, the, he is. He's you know, cut he in. Is treated equally by them. He gets a piece of the action. Right, he's the cook, but he's still an equal mm-hmm. among the small group of people that end up in the island. He's one of the other people they trust. They end up with the people on the island that they don't trust. But Charlie is not one of them. Charlie is part of the group, and I I like that. And Frank Riker is great again as Anglehorn. He also mentions that he may be sued. So he also wants to kind of get out of there. So his, right. his motivations might be a little less pure than Denim's, but either way, I mean, it's it's nice to see some of these characters dealing with the repercussions of what happened in the previous film. Right. Well, exactly. I mean, he's the ship that carried Bong into New York, right? He owns the ship. He's the captain. And if Nick Denim is his word that he's sharing with everyone, then in theory, everyone becomes equally liable. But probably... <laughs> The guy that set up the show and the guy that owned the ship that brought the ape to New York, those are probably the guys that are really going to get nailed. <laughs> yeah, everybody else was just work for hire. you know. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Who are you going to go after? Are you going to go after the penniless guy that used to be the ship's mate and the starlet who hasn't actually made a movie? Or are you going to go after the movie director and the guy that owns the ship? Right, exactly. So, <laughs> You know, I've been mentioning StephenDSullivan.com as his website address. You can also just go to SDSullivan.com, and you'll get taken right there as well. Stephen D. Sullivan, he's a monster kid through and through. He wrote the novelization, the adaptation of White Zombie. He's got the Daigaiju Attack weekly serial going on live as well. And then he's got this Tournament of Death 3 with monsters in it. It's a fantasy thing. It's, you know, Jason and the Argonauts and Spike. Just lots of good stuff. Big thanks to Steve for taking some time out of his busy schedule to appear on Monster Kid Radio to talk about the Son of Kong. We're going to get into part two of our discussion with Steve here in a couple of days on episode number 72. So stay tuned for that. Part of the reason why I'm so excited to be talking about King Kong here on Monster Kid Radio, whether it's about the Son of Kong with Steve or a couple of weeks ago when I talked about King Kong with Chris McMillan, who, by the way, just had a birthday. Happy birthday, Chris is we've got this new documentary coming. We've got Long Live the King, The Legacy of Kong. It's the new documentary coming from Benevolent Monster Productions. There's also a crowdfunding site involved, Capapal. Go to capapal.com. That's K-A-P-I-P-A-L.com. And you can look up Long Live the King, The Legacy of Kong. Or just go to Benevolent Monsters Productions website. That's benmonsterfilms.com. It works just like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. You kick in a little bit, and you can get yourself some awesome rewards, including the DVD. Now, these guys are the same guys who made Best Wishes, The Fantastic World of Bob and Kathy Burns. I love this documentary. It's a great documentary. It's one of the best documentaries I've seen that deals with this Monster Kid stuff that we love so much. 
I can't wait to see what happens with Long Live the King. So get over to BenMonsterFilms.com to learn how you can get involved with this documentary project. They've already got tons of footage shot, and that was without our help. Can you imagine what they can pull off with our help? Again, I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of Monster Kid Radio and everybody's support with the iTunes reviews and everything else that's going on out there, the comments that you make on various message boards about what we do. We love it. We appreciate it. And we appreciate the Surf Zombies agreeing to let us play their song, Never Kill an Ape, on this episode of Monster Kid Radio. Again, look them up on Bandcamp. It's thesurfzombies.bandcamp.com. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Never Kill an Ape. That belongs to the Surf Zombies. It's on their album Lust for Rust. Hope you enjoy it, and I'll talk to you in a couple of days. (laughs) 